right. Welcome, welcome everyone to today's webinar on the origins of COVID-19 and other zoonotic diseases. Uh, my name is Brittany Jamison. I'm the Director of Minnesota Engagement for the Alumni Association. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm really excited to uh, learn uh, from these amazing faculty about something that's really important in our, and really timely, in our world right now. Um, and I've seen they're a pretty fun bunch, let me tell you. So we're going to have fun, as much fun as we can have talking about global pandemic today. That's the goal. Um, just at the beginning here to give us a little starting point, um, I wanted to, before we get into everything, thank our Alumni Association members and donors uh, for making initiatives like the Alumni Webinar Series possible. Um, it's because of their generous support and ongoing loyalty that we're able to offer presentations like this today free of charge to the rest of our university community. So thank you so much for all that you do. If you want to learn more about the Alumni Association membership or any of the programs that we offer, um, a great place to start is by visiting umnalumni.org. And on that note, this is not the only webinar that we offer. We, in this time of, of virtual learning um, and working remotely and staying safe at home, uh, we're offering multiple webinars throughout the Alumni Association. And a few of them have been um, specifically focused on the job search process and identifying some of those, those economic and job related um, issues. So we have an upcoming one that's called Conquering the Virtual Interview. Um, that's with our Director um, of Corporate Relations, Rebecca Lubeck. And um, it's going to be a really interesting presentation on how you can better prepare yourselves to present virtually and have a virtual interview in, in this time of everybody looking at each other through our computer screens. If you're interested in that webinar or any of the other virtual offerings that we have, um, you can visit the URL down at the bottom of the screen. That's umnalumni.org backslash virtual. And um, since I don't assume that everybody is familiar with our Zoom format. I want to take just a moment to walk you through some of the more technical options of what we're going to do today. If you're having trouble hearing me, if your computer screen or your computer volume is a little quiet or you just like to explore another option, there's an option to listen to the presentation via phone at any time. You can dial the number on the screen and you'll be prompted to enter a webinar ID. That's that nine digit number down below, 525-423-615. Um, that one click digital option will appear also in the confirmation email that you sent. So what you can do is open that email on your phone, click on that link and it will dial all of that perfectly for you. So that's if you're having any phone issues at any point. Additionally, you'll see the little Q&A logo. Um, questions are welcome at any time during the presentation. You can submit them. We're going to hold answering those questions until we finish the entire presentation. And then Dom and Katie are going to be at your disposal to answer all of your fun burning questions about COVID-19. Um, so you can submit them there. Um, I'll read out the questions as, they, as we kind of get to that portion of the afternoon. Um, so feel free to submit them. And some of them just know we're going to, we're going to, I'm anticipating a good number of questions today. So I might combine a couple of questions together to try and um, get to a common theme that we're identifying. Um, and at any point in time, you can continue to ask those questions. There's also a chat box if you're having any kind of technical issues or need additional help, or you just want to say hello to your fellow uh, webinar attendees, that's a great place to do so. And with all of that, let me transfer over to the people that you want to hear from more than me. Um, and our first presenter for today's uh, webinar is uh, Dominic Travis. And Dr. Travis is an associate professor for the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine. And he also um, has an appointment with the School of Public Health and the Institute of the Environment. He is an expert in wildlife epidemiology and veterinary public health, focusing on emerging health and natural resource sustainability, the interface of wildlife and domestic animals. And oops, sorry, his entire biography just went away from me. And um, he, nope, you're good. Go back, go ahead, Dom, you're fine. Uh, previously, he's worked on designing and conducting disease surveillance and health risk assessments on emerging zoonotic diseases, such as West Nile virus, the avian influenza, SIV and HIV, anthrax, Ebola, all of the fun ones, basically. If there's a giant disease, 
He's worked on it. Um, Dr. Travis has served on advisory committees for the World Health Organization, the European Union, as well as for the United States Departments of Health, Human Services, Agriculture, Homeland Security, and several health-focused conservation non-government organizations. His current research focuses on interactions between animal and human health, biodiversity, food and water security, and the global wildlife trade. But you don't have just one incredibly qualified presenter today. We have two incredibly qualified presenters. Uh, Dr. Katie Pelican is also joining us. She's the Associate Professor and Head of Ecosystem Health Divisions for the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Minnesota. She is also a researcher and resident fellow at the Institute um, on the Environment. Dr. Pelican has research projects focused on understanding health and disease at the Human Livestock Wildlife Interface in Africa, Panama, Chile, and in Minnesota. Dr. Pelican has additionally worked for the United States Departments of Agriculture, also known as the USDA, the World Bank, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Thank you both for giving us your time today. We're very excited to learn and hear from you on all you have to offer. And now is your very exciting moment, Dom, to uh, cover all things on the Anthropocene. I'm very excited. All right, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. <laughs> Um, thank you for that introduction and thanks for inviting us to be here. Um, interestingly enough, Katie and I went to graduate school together as well. Um, so I am very interested in the history of disease and today's events are not um, the only that we've experienced. I think people know this is my prop. It is a plague doctor's mask um, from the old, old, old days um, before germ theory and things. Um, and I want to kick this off um, by highlighting my friend Frodo behind me, who is, uh, if you read Jane Goodall's work, um, you will know that Frodo is uh, a typical alpha male in the Gombe community. Um, but he also represents um, a long-term study uh, in the evolution of HIV, which we're going to discuss to set up um, a transition to Katie when she talks about COVID. So I wanna start with a story. Once upon a time, not so long ago, I lost some words in that. Um, people wanted to have to travel faster and they started to invent vehicles for doing that. And if you've ever had a little kid and a bike with no pedals, it started with something called the Velocipede um, and changed over time as people became innovative in their ways to travel and created in the 1860s pedals and cranks for that bike and then a chain and gears, which also led to the pneumatic tire. Um, in 1887, John Boyd Dunlop, a Scottish veterinary surgeon, this is my relevance, um, an inventor developed the first practical pneumatic inflatable tire for his son's tricycle from rubber and this caught on. Uh, the application of the internal combustion engine around that time resulted in uh, the motorcycle, the early versions of the motorcycle, and obviously the automobile. And all of the above um, had a demand for pneumatic tires made of rubber. The Dunlop company um, came around about that time. And this, as it scaled up, became an industrial endeavor um, on a global scale. And they needed to source that rubber. And rubber comes from trees, if you don't know that, not to insult anybody's intelligence. And those trees are found in the tropics. And this is kind of a distribution um, of the rubber trees around the globe. So this demand created uh, the need to engage in extractive industries um, and forestry and the rubber trade at that time. And that happened to coincide in the late 1800s with something that is being discussed in our world right now a lot. Um, and this is in the form of the horrific kind of legacy of colonialism, especially in Africa. So the Berlin Conference in 1884, right around the time the pneumatic tire was invented, 
uh, was basically a meeting of the European countries to carve up Africa uh, after they had been squabbling and fighting over different pieces, usually around the edges of Africa and then over time into the, the central part of Africa. And that resulted in a scaling up of extractive industries. And one story of that is told in a good book called King Leopold's Ghost. And it's talking about the colonization um, and legacy of that in what was the Belgian Congo at the time. The casement report in 1904 uh, was considered kind of one of the first truth tellings of this story. And it highlights uh, horrific uh, actions um, under colonialism uh, that we're not going to go into in depth today, but we're certainly having a lot of societal conversations about at the moment. And I wanted to draw that parallel slightly. And there are some excerpts from that that talked about how going in and extracting rubber from these trees was a slow, painful, dangerous work. Nobody volunteered to do it. So of course, the colonists uh, found volunteers that weren't so volunteer-like, um, and they rounded up work groups and put them to work in these concessions that they had. And this is reviewed in uh, a really good article that I list here about the history of, of this trade. Um, and the conditions under that, those work groups were, were not good either. Um, and so again, talking about parallels today's conversations, um, kind of the colonialism, the, uh, the labor force and the work um, and the injustice associated with that um, are all parallels. But these groups went into the deep forest and they had to feed themselves. And when they had to feed themselves, they lived off of um, either what traditionally was being taken, right, and hunted, um, or what was available. And there's a good book covering this called Eating Apes, um, because apes were one of those. And uh, quick warning on some graphic pictures here. Um, the hunting of non-human primates, monkeys and apes, uh, was scaled up beyond subsistence living and, um, and became another extractive industry over time in itself as part of the wildlife trade. An unintended consequence of all of this exposure um, was the emergence of HIV. And it came from several viruses or strains of simian immunodeficiency virus that evolved separately, whoops, sorry, that's not what I meant, um, that's, that evolved separately from different species. So SIV is a virus um, that co-evolved peacefully in the forest with different species, uh, was not thought to or is not generally thought to cause uh, pathology or disease in these animals, uh, but that when we came into contact, spilled over into us and from chimpanzees, we got HIV-1, groups M and N. Um, from sooty mangabe monkeys, we got HIV-2. And most recently, uh, we have strong evidence of the emergence of HIV-1, groups O and P from gorillas. Um, and so these viruses spilling over and mutating as retroviruses do quite often and adapting to humans and then scaling up and spreading between humans is the story of HIV. Um, we know that this happened uh, at least four times uh, based upon the evidence of old samples and materials and new diagnostic methods. And it's right at the corner between Cameroon, Central African Republic, Republic of Congo, and DRC. And those are where there's rich old growth hardwood forests um, that were part of the extractive industry. So right in this area. And so the emergence of HIV, AIDS, is based upon the cut, hunt, the cut hunter hypothesis. Um, and if you look at this area again, and, and it's spillover and emergence, uh, it then was compounded by this trade down the river system of these, um, the scaling up of the rubber trade down the Sanga River to the Congo River, down to what was then Brazzaville. Um, and the growing capital of Brazzaville as a colonial not just outpost, but a colonial center. And this graph shows over time, and I'm struggling with my mouse, this graph shows over time, uh, you can see by decade, uh, the growth of the population of these areas and the spread of HIV based upon that growth. So it was released out of the forest, down the river system, 
into the growing cities and then exported out across the world from there. This story is told really well in uh, a book that is by a New York Times writer um, called Tinderbox, which I really like. And a link to this video is a time-lapse kind of world map of, of the spread of this over time, showing that evidence as early as the 1900s um, all the way through today, obviously, um, of the global spread of HIV and of the different strains of that. So this eating of apes, this local extractive industry that released a disease um, is part of what we consider the overall wildlife trade. And there's a lot of different aspects of that um, and a lot of different reasons for that. And we'll talk briefly about that. But in case you think this is old historic knowledge, uh, a group of us, including Equal Health Alliance and University of Minnesota, did an analysis of all the trade data that we could get our hands on in the United States from 2000 to 2013 and showed that there were over 5 uh, billion individual, well, look at the red one, let's focus on that. Um, there were over 11 billion individual specimens or animals, plus an additional almost billion of things identified by weight um, wildlife imported into the United States legally or declared. Um, so some of it was confiscated, but um, a third of that was live. So some of it is things like mother of pearl and a lot of aquatic items and, and coral and things like that, but a third of it was live. Um, things that were illegal or undeclared included some very important species to conservation, um, but also some very risky species in terms of disease spread, um, like non-human primates. Um, so the drivers of this trade, right, and of this issue are obviously human population growth and globalization, but this demand in terms of food, medicine, fashion, trinkets, research, and exhibiting, and pets, over half of these were associated, of the live ones, were associated with the pet trade. So um, there's a huge economic uh, layer of this conversation. And when you talk about formal trade, you can start to assess the economics, but when you start to talk about illegal or informal trade, meaning there's no regulation, so it's informal, um, you start to undercut economies as well. So there's a huge economic conversation about justice, about sustainability and other things associated with this. And there's a huge land use discussion as we convert land and we change our ability to get to animals or our reliance upon animals um, there's a huge dynamic with that as well. So why does this matter? Well, conservation and biodiversity, um, this economic development, there are a lot of pathways that run parallel to a lot of crime pathways and terrorism pathways. And so some of the same pathways exist and some of the funding is derived. It's a huge animal welfare issue. So in veterinary medicine, we care a lot about animal welfare. These things are not shipped under ideal conditions especially the informal trade, but even the formal trade, there's a lot to learn and a lot to, uh, a lot of progress to be made uh, in the way we ship animals. And then health risk to humans. There's also health risk to livestock and domestic animal species. Um, and this is the spread of potential disease around the world um, via these pathways is known as pathogen pollution, uh, which is human induced movement of infectious agents to new regions. Um, so there's a jargony term for you. So all of this is to say that, well, oh, and there are a few examples in the United States of uh, things that were introduced to the United States via the wildlife trade. Um, so there was a monkeypox outbreak uh, via the rodent trade and rodent pet trade that was in 2003 that got a lot of attention by the CDC and created a lot of uh, regulatory approaches to rodents and small pocket pets. Uh, it's well known that reptiles and amphibians carry things like salmonella, um, which is, I think, on most people's radar. This issue of the spread of HIV, um, I just covered. And then there were a lot of regulatory energy and surveillance energy around the changing influenzas and the bird trade, not poultry necessarily, but the wild bird trade um, globally in the early 2000s as well. So there were a few cases uh, where H5N1, which was kind of that 
scary one in the early 2000s um, of it being found in other places via the bird train. So this risk does happen. So just a quick note on, on the most intimate of these interfaces, um, whether we've talked about pets or other types of reasons like religion and, and, and um, medicine and things like that. But the most intimate, intimate interface for the spread of these infectious diseases is wild meat, sometimes termed bush meat. That's a generic term, not really well defined um, and not really well understood. It usually by conservationists means when you start to talk the, about the unsustainability of this trade. So subsistence living, I hunt, it's managed by the DNR, I eat what I hunt, or it's, it's uh, a sustainable offtake. Bushmeat is, used to be meant as um, when it was becoming unsustainable, when it was becoming big business. And after the Ebola outbreaks uh, of around in this last decade, there um, was kind of a generic use of the term bushmeat. So we try to go back to wild meat. Um, and what is wild? We're talking about China, about a lot of farmed animals, farmed wild animals that are raised for meat and other products. So we're getting into what is wild even more. Um, but in generally, we mean any non-captive housed or reared source of food. Um, and um, these foodborne risks are something we're very concerned with. So we looked in that subset of data um, with the global or the US wildlife trade. And we looked during the Ebola outbreak in 2013, uh, or maybe it was 2015, um, for the risk from West Africa of the countries that had the Ebola outbreak and how much business we did. And we still found a lot of traffic between the United States and West Africa prior to the Ebola outbreak when they shut everything down. Um, and this is kind of a list of what we found. Um, I won't go through every bullet except to say that 66% uh, of what we found were non-human primates, shockingly. Um, the others were rodents and antelope and bats. Most of those bats were for scientific purposes, um, but still there's some fairly high risk species with that. So even just up to the Ebola outbreak, we had a fairly substantial level of trade between West Africa and the United States in live wildlife that were in risky categories. Um, so based upon that, we built this program called Forest to Fork to look at the systems approach to the utilization of wildlife as food and trying to understand the contribution of wildlife to global food security. Um, and we've discovered that no matter what risk assessment you do on what kind of systems approach of what kind of trade route, it comes down to people and we know that. And it comes down to people's actions, their values, their culture. And so we've tried to design a program that looks at through at this issue through a very respectful cultural lens. Um, so we've added a lot of social scientists and a number of graduate students who are social scientists and medical people to look at the social drivers and the cultural aspects of this. And this highlights one study in the Twin Cities. During the Ebola outbreak, we worked with the medical school at UMN to look at the Liberian community that was here and their importation of bushmeat and their perceptions of the risk of that. And they um, had had a number of interactions where that were not so culturally positive um, that were um, kind of accusing them of Ebola risk. And it took about a year to get them to talk to us and discuss this and then think about how we could help them understand the risks associated with what they were doing um, and help ourselves understand their culture, their demand, and their needs in terms of um, just the social aspects of their traditions. And so that's an example. One last example is a project we have farther away from home that one of our graduate students, Melissa Milstein, runs. She's a DVM and now PhD student um, with the YY community in the Amazon in Guyana. And they've been working, uh, Chris Schaefer who, and Marissa have been working with this community for a long time looking at sustainable utilization of the area they manage. So they, they own their own area, they manage their own land, traditional land, 
and they they live mostly off of wildlife, whether that's aquatics or terrestrial. Um, and while they were planning for sustainability of eating monkeys, which is key to their cultural traditions, people were telling them, don't eat monkeys, it's dangerous, you could die. And they started asking the anthropologists for advice, and we're now building a health program in parallel with the Sustainable um, Wildlife Conservation and Management Program to look at their culture, not only the sustainability of the products they use and need, um, but also the risks associated with those and how they may manage those. And that is the example in my mind of um, taking a cultural approach to food security as it intersects with wildlife and understanding and addressing the spillover disease risks that may occur on those systems. So I will leave you from my part with this is how do we balance local indigenous cultures and practices and while we close the gap in food protein and security, while we preserve habitat and natural resources under the conflicting demands for land use, agriculture, um, urbanization, um, under sustainable conservation practices and economic development. And that is the space in which we're trying to play and in which these diseases are emerging as a consequence of this complex interplay between these factors. And so we look at these diseases as unintended consequences of this complexity of culture and of the human drivers in these systems um, and these habitats and the envir these environments. So our solution is this idea of the discipline of ecosystem health which um, is akin to One Health and planetary health and some other things you may hear. We chose an ecosystem health um, because we like the philosophical pieces here of systems-based thinking, transdisciplinary partnerships, participatory community engagement-based research and solutions, the idea of implementing sustainability and resilience into these models, um, the fact that it focuses on gender and social equity and justice, and the fact that it focuses on action. So using research for applied action under this complexity. We were just lucky enough to get a USDA grant, um, a NEFA grant in higher education to build a minor in ecosystem health in the undergraduate curriculum to then try and scale up into a graduate program over time. Um, and so this forest to fork program bundling these kinds of situations um, in many field sites around the world and now the small stimulation of a USDA grant for a training program that will help create new professionals able to attack these, these kind of problems with multiple non-traditional skill sets is kind of our goal. And this is just my advertisement for a Facebook page that you could look up if you still do Facebook. Um, and we have people from all the continents putting, um, well, besides Antarctica, putting uh, news and articles and things into this if you're interested in more. So with that, I will turn it over. Thanks, Dom. I am just gonna bring up my portion of this. Um, so yeah, um, really appreciate being able to talk to you today. Uh, just so I'm currently the co-director of a new office at the university called Spark which is to support large scale interdisciplinary programs um, and leading a COVID action net network, a group of volunteers along those lines, right? So more and more I find myself in, you know, Don was talking about ecosystem health, but this, um, the need to coordinate and collaborate better across different disciplines towards uh, kind of pro big problems in the world, like we're talking about today. Um, I just also want to mention, we've, I, uh, my team, Dom, has been part of that team, uh, among a variety of other folks at the university, have worked in over in 28 countries now um, over the last 10 years, focusing on one health challenges, ecosystem health challenges, but uh, particularly around pandemic risks like the one we're dealing with right now. So part of that was a USAID funded project called One Health Workforce. Um, and uh, we also co-developed with USDA um, a new tool, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, called One Health Systems Mapping and Analysis Resource Toolkit. 
And we've also worked with the World Health Organization to support their, what they call their focal points for international health regulations, which are the individuals or groups of individuals in countries responsible for monitoring and reporting to WHO on uh, basically systems to support infectious disease threats. So this is, talk is really coming from that experience of, of work in all those places. Um, and, you know, Dom talked about uh, the HIV and the AIDS epidemic at, as sort of a slow motion pandemic, which it certainly has been um, originally uh, from zoonotic origin or the uh, origin emerging from animals. Well, I think what we know we're experiencing now is a very, a much faster version of a pandemic, which is uh, the COVID-19 disease uh, pandemic. And really this is a classic One Health challenge. Just to remind us all where we are, <laughs> um, this is a map of where there are cases of uh, COVID right now. This is from WHO on Sunday. Um, and the answer is it's everywhere. There are very a few, very few countries, if you can find any white on this map, um, that say they do not have COVID, but I think we can all be assured that there is COVID there. They're probably just not reporting or testing for it. So it is a global, we are sharing this with the whole wide world. And um, I do want to remind everyone that we are in the middle of this pandemic. It may feel sometimes in the United States that we are, you know, sort of recovering from this, but in reality, globally, certainly we are in the middle of it. For those of you who are familiar with outbreak response curves, they typically follow a lovely bell curve pattern. So they go up and they level off and then they go down. Um, and in large scale epidemics, they often follow cycles like that. So they'll go up and down and up and down and up and down. Well, we're not even done with our first up yet. So, you know, I think we're, we're still in the early stages of this pandemic, in fact. This is the da data from Minnesota. So, um, and I think we could, and you know, it looks like at least uh, the top is deaths per day and the bottom is hospitalizations per day. Um, and, you know, I think we can, deaths are probably, you know, look like they're pretty steady, maybe going down a little bit, but cycling like we talked about. And then um, hospitalizations might look like we're going down, but I think we can expect that there's gonna be multiple curves like this over the next um, year until we get a vaccine. So like HIV, uh, like many emerging diseases, uh, COVID is a zoonotic disease. It emerged from animals. I think we do know that. We don't know everything about how it did that. We, obviously from Dom's talk, we know a lot more about HIV now based on uh, molecular studies. But we do know that um, uh, most diseases that are emerging come from animals or are associated with animal populations, whether it be vectors or other host species of wildlife or domestic animals, so 75%. Um, and we do continually have diseases emerging, um, but even day-to-day -day diseases, um, about 60% are have some kind of zoonotic origin or um, are associated with an active interaction with uh, animals. Rabies is sort of one that most people are aware of, tuberculosis, there are many. This is kind of old data, but a kind of a classic in the emerging infectious disease literature, um, which shows that di these diseases are increasing. We're seeing more of them um, over time, and that is not slowing down. So, and, and again, this also showed that most of them have a zoonotic origin, and most of those are wildlife related. So how does this happen? Um, since that original paper, we've done, you know, done quite a bit of work looking at what, how this works. Um, and this is sort of our current uh, best understanding, I would say, which is we have these very, what we call, you know, viruses with what we call as high plasticity, which means they can move between different species. Some viruses, many viruses in the world, many bacteria in the world are host specific. You can only find them in one species. But these, ho these zoonotic viruses are ones that jump between species and are able to survive in different species. So they may circulate among different wildlife or uh, domestic animal populations, among vectors. Um, but then at some point, they, 
day what we call spill over into human populations. And in this case, from the virus's perspective, that's not different than any of the other jumps they're doing. They're just jumping around between species and humans happen to be one of those species. But of course, we care a lot about that jump into people. Um, and often, once it gets into people, it may just have a localized outbreak that's associated with a direct connection to animals. Or it may be a virus that's capable of doing more than that in the human population and begin to spread among people. So, um, so you have the spillover event and then you, become, you get amplified uh, to begin to have human to human transmission. And ultimately, depending on the virus, it may die out. We saw that with SARS. Um, or it may become what we call endemic in the human population and become effectively a human disease. Um, once it begins this human to human spread, it may slowly or it may rapidly, as we've seen with COVID, spread around the world. So these are different phases of an emergence event. Um, and so I wanted, the sort of the next thing I wanted to look at is what are associated with these different phases? So what, is, what are some of the risks and some of the drivers at these different phases? So we have the emergence event, we have the amplification event and we have the globalization event. And as we do those things, we move from an outbreak, which is just a definition of a disease that's a little above baseline. So outbreaks can be very short or very long. It moves into an epidemic where you have a, a much greater uh, rise in disease above baseline. It spreads much more widely. Um, and then you get into a pandemic, which is a global spread, an out of control spread of a disease. And so as you, I think most of you know, we are officially, according to World Health Organization, in a pandemic right now with COVID. And each of these phases has different risk factors. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about some of them. There are many of them. Um, but if we're talking about emergence, the first thing is that plasticity of the virus, right? So this is from a paper from 2015. So again, we've been learning about these pandemics for a while. Um, in this, this is basically a graph depicting viruses that are jumping between species. So as you see the little, all the little nodes in this represent different groups of animals, right? So there's rodents in the middle, there's primates, there's, these are bats, um, and then the pink or the purple represents wildlife and the blue represents domestic animals. And um, the closer these species are to the middle, the more they have viruses that represent this plasticity. Plasticity. So we are, as primates, humans are in this little primate bucket right here. Um, we are at greater risk for zoonotic diseases from things like rodents, from bats, um, and we have connections to many of these animals. And so it's in this space where these viruses are jumping that we have risk. And the same paper actually looked at where humans are getting these diseases. Where is the exposure? So looking at um, viruses and where humans are getting exposure to viruses. And so the bigger the circle here, the more likely the exposure. So, and the dark blue represents wildlife direct threat from wildlife, and the light blue represents indirect, right? So that might be through, for example, a livestock species. And, you know, we are getting exposure in a lot of places. Um, you know, that's human, our own dwellings. Obviously, uh, I have, happen to have, be fighting a rodent in my own kitchen these days. Um, but also, as Dom talked about, through the pet trade, through the wildlife, meat trade. Um, so there's many exposures um, and it's complex. Um, and what we know is that more and more exposures are happening. That's partly why the risks are going up. Um, and partly why that's happening is because we are interacting with diverse, biodiverse groups of wildlife. And why that's happening is that we are, just like with the rubber trade, moving into these biodiverse forests more and more and causing stress in them and um, interacting with species we haven't interacted with before. Um, and so it's these interest, these spaces where humans are actively, dynamically interacting with wildlife in all of these different ways. Um, which tends to be in areas of high deforestation, high environmental degradation. Those are the high-risk places. 
So, okay, we've emerged, right? We have emerged because humans are in new places, exposed to new groups of biodiverse animals, interacting with the new ways, extracting them in a variety of ways. So we've had our spillover event. Well, how then does it move into an amplification phase where it might be more likely to spread between people? And the answer is uh, we are growing in population we are interacting differently. So this is a little bit of an animation looking at world population growth starting in 1950 and looking forward to 2100. And what we see, it's not completely random that these diseases are becoming pandemics that are rising out of Asia, in part because the population is there is very big. There's already been a lot of deforestation in that area of the world. So there's been a lot of interaction but you might notice too that another place and an increasing risk is areas of Africa where population is rapidly increasing. It's likely to become one of the most populous places in the world and many of the countries there. Um, and again, that's an area of, ra of rapid and active deforestation. So um, the risks are changing, but the sort of the recipe stays the same. Also around the globe, we are seeing increased uh, demand for meat. Um, and again, these livestock species tend to be uh, intermediaries of some of these viral loads. They also can carry the diseases around the globe too. Um, also as part of this grouping of zoonotic diseases, it's not just diseases that are at risk to humans, but also diseases that are at risk to livestock, which of course is critical for maintaining um, good nutrition around the world um, and food security. So meat production plays a role and that is also increasing dramatically um, as we, our population grows, but also as people get more wealthy around the world. And we're becoming more urban. These urbanized areas are areas where obviously humans are mixing much more dynamically, not just becoming more population dense, but also moving from city to city to city much more easily. So um, this trend towards urbanization um, has been dramatic and continues to be dramatic. This was from 2010, representing the urbanization around the globe. Um, this is what it's expected in 2050. So this is not a trend that is expected to go away. And again, contributes to the threats. Okay, so we've emerged, we spilled over, and now we're beginning to see an epidemic in humans. Um, how then does it move into a globalization or a pandemic phase? Um, and the answer is, uh, and I think we all know this, we live in an increasingly globalized world, right? So this is a very recent, I just downloaded some Sunday uh, analysis of global air traffic um, associated with the increase, the introduction of COVID. So even at, at the end of this, you see that the the traffic decreases dramatically, it's still very pretty dramatic how much connection we have around the globe, even in the face of a pandemic that's shut down a lot of it. But at the beginning, you see how much there is on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so we are very connected by air. We are also very connected by production. Um, so this is all the boats on the ocean yesterday. Um, so even again, even in a pandemic, we have live in a very, very connected world um, where goods are moving. Many of those goods are animal products. Uh, as Dom mentioned, uh, both wildlife and, li and livestock animal products, and all of these pose some level of risk of movement of disease. Uh, Dom already covered this very well, but you know, it's not just legal wildlife trade, it's also illegal wildlife trade, and, and we are more connected than we realize through, you know, this again, this direct risk of transmission from, from wild animals of concern. For those of you who are familiar with the sustainable development goals, you might notice that the risks that I'm talking about uh, have very close connection to a lot of other issues that we're trying to deal with around the world, um, represented by the sustainable development goals. These are complex issues, things like poverty, things like food security, things like economics. Ta Dom has talked about this, but I think you know, we need to keep in mind that the 
the issue of pandemics is closely related to how well we're doing in terms of sustainability around the world. And you know, helping some of these issues that Sustainable Development Goals aims at um, is as important as anything in terms of minimizing these risks. And we also want to point out, this is a nice uh, graphic that came out a little while ago, looking at that the pandemic itself affects many of these issues. So um, I know I've been involved in, through the COVID Action Network, in a number of food security questions around the state. Um, so, you know, the pandemic, there's a relationship there. Um, we need to be more sustainable to prevent pandemics, and pandemics have a close relationship with many of these sustainability issues for human and uh, environmental pop populations around the world. So how do we deal with these risks? Um, I think there are, and that's where kind of one health approaches or ecosystem health approaches come um, and where we've been really spending a lot of our time. Uh, what we know is that these are complex. They require many, many, many agencies and organizations to address them. So this is a uh, graphic that we created around the avian influenza outbreak that happened in 2015 here in the state. This is an animal disease, um, stayed in the animal population, but posed a risk to humans. And you can see there are many agencies involved in trying to deal with this outbreak. It's complex and they don't always uh, coordinate and collaborate very well. So in order to address these threats, both at the outbreak stage, but also at the prevention stage, we need to do a better job of coordinating and collaborating around the globe. We have been uh, honored to be part of a initiative that started under Obama, um, but was a collaboration among 50 different countries called the Global Health Security Agenda, focused on reducing infectious disease threats around the world. It involved many governments, it involved many US government agencies, there was a good collaboration and coordination, I would say, around this agenda. And what we're trying to do there is to create a framework where this collaboration and coordination can occur seamlessly and be strengthened. And so that includes policy changes and regulatory changes, strengthening of operations and practice, and strengthening the workforce. The work we did with Workforce under the One Health Workforce Project, we focused on what is, we really realized you need a new kind of workforce to do this work. Um, one that has the skills to collaborate and coordinate effectively, has the technical skills to do well in their own discipline. So public health is excellent in public health. Veterinary medicine is excellent in veterinary medicine. And also has an enabling environment to allow them to work effectively. We worked with 97 universities in 16 countries uh, to develop training programs for training this kind of worker into the future. And that involved working with government to understand what the needs are within the multi-sectoral workforce, develop education and training, and then strengthening the institutions to provide that environment which allows them to work. We also developed this tool, OSmart tool I mentioned earlier. This is supports many agencies getting together, examining their own system and developing action plans to improve how they coordinate and collaborate. This is a map that we produce. Each swim lane here represents a different agency. This is, was for this avian influenza response. Um, and you see how they organize, how they're coordinated. And then they identify where, ways they can improve that coordination and they develop an action plan. This was an action plan for brucellosis, a zoonotic disease in cattle um, for uh, Ethiopia. So. We've applied this in 30 different states and 18 different countries, a lot around infectious disease, although not all. Um, and what we find is that we are not so great at coordinating and collaborating. So there are wide scale gaps in coordination. There's many opportunities to improve. Most of the coordination that occurs is ad hoc um, and does not have formalized processes in place. And so there's a lot of room for improvement in this coordination. I think we've seen some of those challenges here in the United States that always happens uh, in an emergency because things are never perfect, but you know, there's ways that we can prepare better to have better coordination collaboration. We've also supported the tripartite, which is the UN agencies that are involved in these issues, uh, World Health Organization, World Organization for Animal Health, and the Food and Agriculture Organization to develop a tripartite guide for zoonotic diseases and managing zoonotic diseases and some of our team anyway is supporting 
implementing this guide and helping countries think this through better. And a lot of that, again, is coordination. So, so often groups come in piecemeal and try and help countries. They have many different tools. The countries are confused about how to implement them. So we've also been involved in trying to make recommendations for coordinating tool use. And this is a paper that came out. You'll see OSMART is in here, but there are many different tools and we're recommending how countries should implement these that to be most helpful. So just concluding, you know, from this work in 28 countries, threats are arising. They're complex. COVID is one, and it's certainly one that's raised everyone with the profile on this, but there's others, and there's many complex things that contribute to COVID. That we need new workers to do to work on these, that we need operation, new operational approaches um, to better manage these risks, and that new policies and systems are needed to formalize some of these interdisciplinary processes. And with that, I open to questions. All right, so uh, we're going to bring everybody back here. And I was just, um, if you haven't been watching the chat, um, I've, I've gotten a few questions that were sent directly to me. So I, I popped those in the chat for um, people. And Dominic started just answering all of them. But I want to hit a couple <laughs> of them. He was on it. It's a lot of information. No so problem. if you had a chance, I um, would encourage you to do so. Take a look at those. But I wanted to hit some kind of higher level pieces of some of those themes, because I think they're important. And I understand that not everybody's going to be joining us sharing, looking at the chat. And so the first one I wanted to talk about was um, if you guys could give me just like a 30 second um, overview of what you think we're learning based on like the COVID outbreak. What is the COVID outbreak teaching us about public health, global health, zoonotic diseases in general? Like, is, is it worth it, you know, that we're all going through this kind of crazy situation at the moment? Don, do you want to answer that or do you want me to? No, it's it's your turn. I've been chatting away on the chat. So uh, sure. I, I want, yeah, I want to make sure that you get your shot. You know, I do think we, I think one thing is we need to be better in terms of coordination and collaboration. Um, and I, I think that's certainly true in the United States. It's true all over the globe. I do say that some of the group, some of the countries where we have worked uh, over the in those 28 countries, those countries that we know are more sort of more organized and collaborative, seem to be doing better in some ways in terms of the COVID um, response and be, just being able to manage this. So that's one thing. I think we always have to work on the sort of our coordination across nations. Um, and I think WHO is, you know, doing a lot uh, for that, working with some of these other agencies. Um, but there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of building trust among our countries. When we're dealing with a global threat like this, you know, I think we need systems in place again that cut across countries, that cut across our different agencies. And I, I, the other thing I would say is um, these emergency response efforts, I think very often that one group or another is in charge with public health, it's public health is in charge. And I think they forget all the other groups that are involved. Um, and I think having some systems in place that would allow better coordination among groups that are responding would be, you know, so for example, okay, this dynamic of the discussion between are we going to open up and as a which I know is a concern for public health, or are, and, you know, or are we going to stay down? But you know, there's trade-offs there between economics, between food security, um, poverty, and public health, and that should be a dialogue, right? Of what is kind of the best option, uh, and I'm not sure that's always happening. Um, and part of that, I think, is our tendency to say public health is looking down their swim lane and saying. Everything's under control um, in public health, but then oh, but and those other annoying people are trying to do something else, right? So yeah, when um, we when we yeah. teach ecosystem health, we talk about the spider web, and most solutions are pulling on a strand, and you have these ripple effects or these cascading events throughout the spider web, the unintended consequences. And if we don't look at this holistically, if we don't look at the whole web, or what we can do of the web, and that's what Katie's tools do, um, is create a web out of these conversations then we, we can't start to look at those optimization among all these different values and needs 
um, and we'll continue to just pull on things and watch the ripple effects happen. And that's how we got here. It's not helpful, right? That's how we got here. Yeah. yeah. So, and like things like, and I'm, I'm not going to get too political here, but things like defunding WHO are, are not the solution to increase partnership and collective action, right? So um, continuing to support institutions, uh, global institutions, I think are a really important part of that. Awesome. So Linda had a question, when is the current best estimate on uh, kind of like the timeline around when COVID passed from animals to humans? There's a lot of information out there in the news. Do we have an answer? Is it realistic to have an answer? Does it help us if we had an answer? We have several answers. <laughs> yeah, we have not con come to an agreement. Dom, you go ahead. Yeah, so, okay. So I work kind of indirectly um, with the Wuhan lab in China conversation. Um, and we, the first story was this market in Wuhan, China, Wuhan, um, right, that has a lab next to it. And there's, don't get sidetracked by the whole lab conversation um, kind of thing. The risk is not zero, but it, it's very unlikely to be that. Um, so they found it in this market and they said, oh, look, market, there's wildlife, there's all these mixed species. And then there were reports that, well, they found it in the market, but it was already kind of big enough. Maybe they just discovered it in a place where there were enough cases and maybe it was happening. You know, then there's all these reports of individual spillover events in villages on the front lines. And so the farthest back they've been able to track it was in November, I believe, right? There were some cases not in the Wuhan market area. So they think it started outside. Either way, we know that it lived in bats. We knew that it was in bats. We know that there are SARS-1 and this, and then four other things that have been identified living in those bats, in those species, out in those tropical forests. And it was just kind of waiting to happen. So. Thank you. Um, so kind of in a similar vein to some of that, um, there, there's a very interesting response in the chat, but I'm going to ask you to talk about it on the video too, uh, about do we think or slash agree that consuming meat would help stop in the spreading of these pandemic, like stopping that consumption? And the, the person that asked it basically said, if more of the world went vegan, would that be enough? Would that be enough for us to stop all of this? Is that the solution to, to these kinds of issues? Do you want me to read my response? Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so to the question about eating meat and veganism, so, and, and this will help Katie think a little bit about her complexity for her answer. So our current food system is in itself a solution to another problem of increased population, demand, food security, and access, right? So we have food, but do we get it to the right places? So I don't think deconstructing the current food system is a solution, but rethinking it may be. Food is both access and preference. So we have the human condition in here. It's the cultural part of all of this, right? Um, but we do need to have a really frank conversation about this complexity um, because what we're currently doing is, um, again, pulling on one or less of those strands of the spider web as a solution to, to issues. And how do we maybe think a little bit more holistically about that? So that's my version, Katie, go ahead. Well, and, you know, as you remember back to that sort of the bubble diagrams I showed you, it's not just about food, um, that we are exposing, I mean, if you think about the rubber plantations, that wasn't necessarily about food, it's that we were entering we, and extracting things from forests in areas people hadn't been before, it gave new exposures. So, um, you know, there's lots of things we do in the forest, there's lots of things we do at home, um, as, a, as a species that lead to risk. So um, it's not just about um, animals as food. Awesome, thank you. Um, I know we're running a little bit over two o'clock. We will answer a couple more questions. If you have to pop off though, um, I wanted to let you know that all registrants for today's webinar will receive a link to the recording of this presentation as well as the slide deck. That is gonna be a YouTube link. So if you would like to share that with other individuals who weren't able to attend, you're welcome to do so. But we'll stick around for a few more minutes to answer um, a, a few more questions that are coming up. Um, one of them would be, uh, 
do I need to worry about having pets in the house? Or maybe, as Katie mentioned, you know, sometimes we have little rodent friends living in our kitchens. <laughs> sometimes more than one. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. I freaked out. I Googled when I had a, my first mouse in my old house. I was like, oh my gosh, am I going to die because of the rat in my house? <laughs> so can you tell us what we should be concerned about? What are some kind of things, uh, you know, what are some worries and uh, cautions that we should be taking in those circumstances? Um, I think you have been uh, sort of on a, you can talk a little bit about COVID and pets. I think there's sort of an answer there. Um, and and then, you know, I think some of the, we, we are careful about known zoonotic diseases in pets, things like rabies. Um, and you should always have some, you know, awareness that that some of these diseases can be there and certainly rabies is a big one for our pets. Um, but, uh, you know, and then, you know, rodents have been, as we saw in that diagram, you know, a major source of zoonotic diseases in, in humans. So minimizing exposure to rodents is a good way of preventing some, you know, things like plague, um, which still exists, if you didn't know that. Um, you know, things like that are uh, important to consider in terms of rodent exposure and then bat exposure too. So I'll read my answer since we need the record more than the chat. Um, and then yeah, talk a little bit about COVID. But so my answer was, should we worry? Not necessarily, but be aware and care? Yes. So there's whole textbooks of zoonotic diseases in pets, um, but these depend on many ecological factors. So most are not prevalent, but do exist. So um, part of the annual exams for pets is to screen for potential risks, not only for pets, but the that intersection with humans, right? So that annual exam gives you an opportunity to not only prevent things in pets that can also go to humans like rabies, um, but, but also to ask questions and inform yourself and gather information about your situation specifically, what kind of pets you might have, that kind of thing. So the, the, the next part of that is from wildlife, right, which is a section of zoonotic diseases, there are also other types of things, but rats, bats, and monkeys seem to be the the categories of most concern. And there's all sorts of discussion about those are the ones that adapt to human habitation very well as we move into the forest and th things like that. Or bats sit up in the trees and aren't bothered and do things like um, do normal necessary functions and samples fall to the ground and are on pigs and we get Nipah virus and things like that. With respect to COVID, animals are the victims. So even though this came from bats, right? It co-evolved with bats. It lived peacefully in the forest in whatever way. And our contact has released this and, and all that. Remember that there's a spill back part of this. So there are susceptible animals. We know that the receptors, the, the viruses are locks and keys, right? The virus is the key. And all the species have the little locks that the key opens. And this ACE2 receptor is conserved or similar across many mammal species and thus many mammals are in fact susceptible to this. And we're seeing that when we hear about tigers in zoos or large cats in zoos, not just tigers, or, or domestic cats or ferrets and mustelids um, and things like that. And so, so um, it matters, but we're actually more risky to them than they are to us. Awesome. Well, I'll, I'll leave the last couple of minutes. I want to wrap up here by about 2.10, be respectful of everyone's time. So if you have one last question or two, feel free to drop that in the chat. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, put Dominic and Katie on the spot and say, are there any closing thoughts, last things you want people to think about as they're walking out of uh, a webinar about COVID and origins and all of these kinds of things? What, what's the most important takeaways you want people to leave with? Wear your mask. <laughs> No, I mean, I think for me, it's um, is that we really need to get better at this more systems thinking um, and the connections among some of the things we're doing around our world uh, to some of the things that can really be dangerous to us, um, whether that's food issues, um, pandemics, um, and and sort of other threats to our health um, and our well-being, that emerge from the fact that we're just not doing a great job uh, taking care of some of the 
systems that support us um, around the globe. And I will double down on that and say it's about the spider web, not the strand, um, which is that systems kind of thought. And we, through our ecosystem health teaching, talk a lot about how systems, if you want to be human centric, anthropocentric, um, and you don't just want to think holistically, so much of what we do rely on services from nature, biodiversity, that kind of stuff. There are so many supporting services we get and decisions that we are making about how we manage the world and the systems are undercutting the resilience of those very systems that provide us what we need, fresh water, clean air, food or shelter or whatever from the forest. And, and therefore, we need to stop thinking short term and think more long term about the sustainability, if for nothing else, for the services they provide our own sustainability, because that's the irony is we're doing it to ourselves. Awesome, that's a really great place to end. So I uh, wanna thank both of you again, Dr. Katie Pelican and Dr. Dominic Travis from the College of Veterinary Medicine for sharing with us today. Um, if you have any questions about this presentation or other uh, virtual presentations, uh, visit umnalumni.org and uh, go forth with all of your new knowledge, um, fully equipped and ready to tell everyone you know about exactly where COVID came from. You're now all experts, right? That's what happened. We've all been, <laughs> we've all been given our degrees. Um, so thank you all and have a great rest of your day.